Hey, everybody, what's going on? It is Lauren Delisa Coleman with your very next interview from the French Riviera Film Festival. I have my next interview subject coming to us live and direct from Denmark. Um, his name is Martin Stranga Hansen. I'm trying to get my Danish on with his last name. Um, and he is going to talk to us a little bit about his filmmaking background, um, how he's going to be actually receiving a particular award, albeit virtually, um, at this year's festival. And it should be a fun ride. So, Martin, thank you so much for joining us, especially during your evening evening there in Denmark. You're welcome. You're welcome. I'm most excited to be here. So let's um, talk a little bit about your fabulous, you know, just kind of filmmaking experience and expertise. I mean, um, I wrote down some, you know, elements because I'm just um, so impressed by them. I mean, you were Oscar nominated for a short film called um, On My Mind, and it is actually um, being screened out of competition. Um, during the French Riviera Film Festival. You're also going to be receiving a special industry award there. So tell me a little bit, I guess, about maybe your history, if there is um, such a, as that with this particular festival. And then just a little bit about how you got into the craft of filmmaking overall mm -hmm. from there in Denmark. Well, specifically about the craft, then I, I went to the Danish Film School, I, which is a very well-known uh, film school where also Lars von Trier and Thomas Winterberg and Susanne Beer uh, are from. So it's uh, pretty well-renowned. Uh, and um, But as you might see on the grayness of my hair, it's a couple of years ago. <laughs> uh, so, but when I came out, I made a graduation film called uh, Feeding Desire, which won the Student Academy Awards. And then the year after, I made a short film called This Charming Man Who Won an Academy Award. Uh, and then I had some years where I've been working also as a commissioning editor, and I work a lot of with talent development and screenwriting uh, and all that. And um, then last year, I decided during the lockdown that it was time to use the lockdown because all bars were free. They were closed. So you can make a short film pretty, <laughs> yeah, pretty cheap actually, because you could get a bar for free. Cool. So that is what brought you back to it. And then, um, so uh, On My Mind came out of that particular scenario. Tell us a little yeah. bit about that film. What's, what is it all about? And, you know, what was it like filming that? Well, it's about this guy who one sleepy Tuesday morning walks into this bar uh, where you have these uh, two regulars, I mean, the bartender and the bar owner, and they have, I mean, they're in their everyday life. He's doing the accounts and she's bored. And uh, he comes in and you can feel that he has a heavy heart. There's something nagging this guy. There's something in the air, in the burdens on, of this guy. And he doesn't talk to anyone. He just wants to drink. And then on the way out, he finds out there's a karaoke. And suddenly he wants to sing. And we find out that he wants to sing a song for his wife. Uh, and I shouldn't go into details about why he wants to sing, but it's a very, he has a very, very specific reasons for that. And some of the reason why that came, above, uh, came across was, uh, well, last year, of course, there was the, the uh, corona uh, that made me want to do it. But it's also based on my own experiences about being in this. I, I had a, a daughter who was uh, well lost in 2001 and, and that process in and out of hospital. Uh, at a one point, I went into a bar <laughs> to get a drink and met two people who were not at all in that same period of their life as I was. Uh, and I thought that there's something about that essence of that being that you're not, I mean, you never know what your fellow man is going through. Uh, so that's uh, what's behind the story of, uh, on my mind, you can say. Interesting. So tell me, um, I guess, a little bit about what drew you first to film, Martin, because you said it's, you know, been, been a couple of years. And so, you know, it's still a passion of yours. What drew you mm -hmm. to it first? And what kind of keeps you um, kind of so attached to it? Um, well... <laughs> 
I had, because again, because of Corona, I uh, was writing a script for uh, another director, n- not because of Corona, but because of Corona, I had time on my hands. So I could, you know, normally when you, you have to juggle a lot of jobs uh, and I didn't have to do that because of Corona. So I finished the script early. I finished also a short film script for the same director early. And that was just, I was on fire uh, creatively. So I wanted, I was like, this, this should be used for something, this um, thing. And then there was also like, I had this story hidden deep inside that I wanted to convey uh, and get out there. And so is that what kind of, um, I don't know, just keeps you you going in the film industry because of a uh, passion around storytelling or, I mean, what kind of, as I had asked before, what, what drew you to, to this? Did you fall in, in love with film at an early age or were there certain Danish filmmakers that just really, really, you know, kind of moved you or what? Hmm. I think I'm kind of a cliche in terms of a lot of, I know a lot of uh, filmmakers in my age would say uh, Steven Spielberg uh, inspired me to filmmaking. Uh, but for me, it was not like, I mean, for me, it was like we were uh, attending this, uh, this film club when I was around seven, eight, uh, once, once, a mo- once a year. And then we saw some old swashbuckling films from, uh, yeah, from the 30s, something uh-huh. like that. I remember seeing Robin Hood from 1933 or 38, I think, with Errol Flynn. At one point, there's, there's this uh, knight and he gets, he gets an arrow and you... Whew, and right before I'd seen that film, my mother had said to me, remember if it's scary, that uh, it's just a film, it's not happening in real life. And that thought was so intriguing because I knew it, I mean, I knew this was an illusion. So I was really intrigued by that idea that you could make illusions, magic, uh, show stuff that's not real. Uh, and then later I saw a uh, documentary actually about Steven Spielberg. Like as a kid, he used this uh, eight millimeter camera of his dad's to make short films. And that gave me the idea that it's something that you can do. That it's just not hidden out there. In the, so that kind of fueled my first um, interest in film, I think. And then, well, yeah, get into the Danish film school, which is a, uh, because it's prestigious, it's, I mean, 300 apply to six uh, six uh, seats of directors wow. every second. Yeah. Just amazing. But I love that um, idea of, you know, the magic and the illusion of it um, drawing you as opposed to just you know, what most people say, or many people um, say, many filmmakers just say that, you know, it's obviously to tell a story, but you actually like more of the illusion of it. And I think maybe many of us might say that, right? If you think mm. think back to maybe some of the earlier films, like you said, in childhood, especially, right? Yeah. Um, tell me a little bit about the film making scene or just the film industry there in Denmark. Um, well, as, as most European countries and I think around the world, we are also now having this huge boom in production. I mean, because of all the streaming services. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of stuff going on, which means that if you're a young filmmaker, you have, it's quite an interesting time, I think, to start mm-hmm. being a filmmaker because you can get stuff across to the, the broadcasters uh, and get yourself going very quickly. I, but by that said, I'll also say in Denmark, because we are a fairly small country, five and a half, six million people. And so the film business here is also very small. So we also all have a kind of collective, I mean, we know each other. And even though we are competitors, we are also often very helpful of, of each other, uh, mainly because a lot of us, went to the film sc- same film school and, uh-huh. and, and know each other from there, uh, I think. But that has spread out to all the entire business. So it's like also people who are not from the Danish film school have that, that feeling, I think. Um, but being a small industry as we are, I mean, I'm, we're doing a lot of uh, streaming uh, productions, but we make 25 maybe 30 films a year 
feature film. So that's the, our production volume is not that big. Mm -hmm. Even though, I mean, it's still, uh, you see, have its head pops up uh, in the international sphere from time to time. Like last year, uh, uh, Thomas Winterberg with another round went to the Oscars. And this year, Flea with three uh, groundbreaking uh, nominations. So there's something within the Danish way. And I would say that before I was talking about illusions, one of the things that happened when we, I don't know if you remember the Dogma uh, 95. Uh, sure. Way. Sure. That was sure. actually something that happened because of the Danish film school, because it was kind of last from Trier wanted to go back to uh, some of the things that he experienced in film school, which was you have boundaries, 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 boundaries all the time. And that was really uh, feeding his creativity. And because we don't have huge budgets, then boundaries is a good thing. And all that, what Darkman did was it stripped out everything that was fancy mm -hmm. about filmmaking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Made us, made us aware of those bare necessities being the acting, the relationships, and the storytelling. Because without those, there's nothing, right? It's, and that, I think that's kind of the basics why uh, Danish film has a very good outlook in the world. Really great observation. Um, let's see, you, you said you won't be going to uh, this year's festival, but I'm wondering, have you been there in the past? I can, no, actually not. No? Oh, okay. Well, but I'm sure you've been to many different film festivals in, in your day. Why do you think festivals are just still so important and, you know, people still look to uh, be a part of them, to submit their films, to go, to absorb, like, the energy? Why do you think that still persists? Well, first and foremost, I mean, when you, when you start as a filmmaker, I, I was just in a, in a festival in Seattle uh, the year, week before here and with very, very young filmmakers because I also uh, am a mentor of, of uh, young filmmakers. Oh, great. And, young and we went there and for them, it was the first experience going there with their own film. And that thing that you suddenly are in a crowd of like-minded and you get to talk and you get to talk freely out of passion, which is, I mean, that's, that's so valuable. And those, I've, I've been there before. And I mean, all the festivals I've been to, you get a hook, I won't say not in somebody, but in a network. So you became part of a network that you use uh, beyond uh, the festival. So it's, it's important in terms of, of you and your career and how to grow mm -hmm. as a filmmaker, but it's also something I find extremely important in terms of to be a good filmmaker, to be a good artist, you have to be curious. And what, what, what better way to get your senses bombarded to go than to go to a festival and just get filled up so all your signups just go uh, Yeah. <laughs> So true. So true. I mean, I, I love the way that you put it. Um, I think that we know this, but have it articulated in that manner is, is a lot of fun. And to just, um, I don't know, think about how curiosity does either, you know, drive us or, or not, right? Because if you already know everything, then I guess not much is going to happen, is it? <laughs> so you really do need to become um, curious on a new level each and every time. Yeah. What's yeah, going to be are, next for you, Martin? Uh, what's next? I mean, I have a series that I'm developing on. Uh, Wait, Second World War series. Uh, it's about six children the age of nine to nine years to nine months who in the last winter of uh, Second World War, uh, they walk from Berlin to the Danish border without mom and dad, just alone. No way. And, and their siblings. It's a true story. I know one of the kids. No. Yeah. And before that, they had been through Hitler Jugend camp and school in, in Poland. So the, the kids, the, I mean, the boys who are around seven 
two, six years at that this moment uh, have been trained in surviving in the outdoors. They have been trained in throwing hand grenades. They've been trained in uh, killing their pets uh, because they had to learn to be German soldiers. Uh, and that gives them a strength in the way, but they also learn to survive because their mother has put something which is not war oriented into them, which is civilization. And every, every night they civilize. And that's something I find really interesting, especially in these times where suddenly war is at a doorstep again. Wow. Now, wait, are you doing this for Danish television? Or do you not have yeah, a deal? Yeah, I'm, I'm, de I'm developing it uh, right now. We're in early stages of development. Wow. I've, oh, my gosh. I hope this is going to be available internationally. Yeah. Because, I mean, I can't, I just can't even imagine it. And I thought it was something that you just created, but this is a full-on true story. It's and you know story. one of the children who is now an adult, yeah. of course. And he oh, gave my gosh. That's going to be fantastic to work on. Is, yeah, yeah. I mean, one of the things that I've found out the last couple of years is how much I enjoy. I mean, I've always enjoyed the idea of making stuff up, stuff up right? I mean, that's, that's fantasy, that's fiction, but you get so much power from true stories. There's something so genuine that's really, really interesting. The interesting part is, of course, how you how you stretch them, how you bend them, and how you tell them what's actually the core of them. Uh, but so I'm, I'm feeling myself pretty, pretty damn lucky that this man has trusted me with his story. Absolutely. Well, best of luck working on this. Do you, do you have a title yet or even a working title? Uh, it's a working title. It's called Jungfolk which is German word for very young people, which was also the word for uh, those in school that were not yet Hitler Jugend, but below Hitler Jugend. Unbelievable. Well, I just wish you the best of luck with that. Thank How you. can we stay up to date on like that film and all the other projects that you're working on now? Do you have a dedicated site? I don't really kind of picture you as maybe like a social media guy, or am I wrong? <laughs> I don't really picture you posting a lot. <laughs> All right. I, I, I am on social media. And I would say, that after the Oscars here, I went into a hiatus because I was just exhausted from it. But I do have a, an Instagram, a Bensona Film. Uh, and I'm also, of course, on Facebook and Twitter and what have you. Okay, uh, very so cool. I Wait, sorry, what are the handles on yes. Facebook and Twitter? So the handles on, uh, on Twitter is... Martin Strange, Martin okay. underscore Strange, yeah. And on Facebook, that's just my name, Martin Strange Hansen. Uh, and on uh, Instagram, it's Bensona Film, Bensona with a Z. And I found out that this actually means, in Hebrew, it means uh, son of a bitch or something like that, hijo de puta. Um, but it is uh, the name of my granddad's Oh, great granddad's uh, company as well. He was, wow. He had okay. So well, we yeah. have to stay up to date, especially on this series. Like that's going to be insane. Yeah. It sounds very like HBO already to me. I don't know, but let's see. <laughs> anyway, Martin, I just want to thank you so much for taking the time there in Denmark to speak to us. I hope that the um, virtual receipt of your award from this upcoming film festival will be nice and um, continue success really with everything that you are doing. Thank you. Thank you. Very My much. absolute pleasure. You guys, I hope that you have enjoyed watching this interview with Martin Stranga Hansen and um, definitely try and keep up with whatever he is working on because I feel that um, just his approach and his mindset, is just really intriguing. So, you know, we will be bringing you another interview to click on the very next one. I am as always Lauren Delisa Coleman for the Inside Series here at Filmio. Thank you so much for watching. <laughs>